This world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the word of the Lord. This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. So Jesus proclaims. That is what it has always been about, and what it will always be about. The life of Jesus was not lived, his death was not endured for himself, but for us. The sooner we begin to fully understand this, and accept this, the better off we will be. For the truth about Jesus is for our sake, not his. And yet, as we begin to understand this, there comes a terrible danger. That of the egocentric Christian. A Christianity that's based on the premise that it's all about me. You know, that kind of inevitably, that inevitably leads to, what have you done for me lately? We begin to think about Christianity as something that can benefit me, that it's all about me. It's what have you done for me? What will it do for me? What do I get out of this? What good is it for me in this world? We hear this all the time among people every day. The ones who cannot bring themselves to go to church because church doesn't do them any good. The ones who can't see a reason to spend that hour a day in church or longer because it doesn't benefit them. Does it bring them money? Well, there are those who go to church because it brings them money, because they see church as a place to make nice business contacts. Does it give them prestige? Well, yes, some of them like the prestige of wearing their cross around their neck and demonstrating who they are, because then people will be drawn to them and automatically they think will trust them. Some of them like it because they get to dress up and they get to feel good about themselves for an hour and go away for the week and do whatever else they want, because as long as I make it to church on Sunday, I will be fine. But what good is this? And so the people who do come for all the wrong reasons give a message to those who don't come that it's all about them. And so why should they go? Reminds me of that story of uh, the Sunday school teacher was out, you know, one day teaching the children outside and a salesman was walking by and he decides he's he's going to jerk the chain of the, the Sunday school teacher. And he says, you know, okay. Sunday school teacher, you claim that all this religion is a great thing, and yet there's still violence and destruction, there's all these people who hurt one another, there's all this terrible stealing in the world. What good is your religion since all of this continues to go on? And the Sunday school teacher thought for a moment, and he had a little boy stand up, and he said to the, to the guy, You're a, you make soap, and you sell soap. This little boy named Johnny, okay, is dirty. Look at him, because he's a little boy, and that's what little boys do. What good is all the soap in the world if Johnny's still dirty? To which the soap salesman said, oh, oh, now wait a minute. Soap is only good if you use it on Johnny. To which the Sunday school teacher said, yes, and religion is the same. It only does good if you apply it to your life. Now, Andrew is a man that we don't see at the forefront of the gospel very often. In John's gospel, Andrew only comes to the forefront three times. And in every instance, Andrew is bringing someone to meet Jesus. The first instance we hear about Andrew is when he brings his brother Simon Peter to meet Jesus. The second time we hear Andrew's name is when it's Andrew who brings the little boy with the five loaves and fishes, with the loaves and fishes to see Jesus and then supply food for 5,000 people. And now here, these Greeks who have heard about Jesus and they begin to believe about Jesus, but they want to meet Jesus for themselves because people were always wanting to meet Jesus and get to know him. A request that is, on the whole, pleasing to Jesus. Besides that, people are attracted to power. And Jesus had power. They knew that. There were lots of advantages that might be gained by meeting and getting to know Jesus. 
In his response to Andrew, Jesus tells us that in order to really see him, to really and truly know him, there is a price to be paid. Jesus was willing to pay the initial cost with his life. Willing to die so that others might truly know who he is. And in turn, truly know God. Truly, Jeremiah had prophesied this day would come. A day when God would make a new covenant with his people that could not be broken. A new covenant of forgiveness and knowledge. That there would be no longer a chasm between God and God's people. There would no longer be the veil separating God from his people. And Jesus knew Jeremiah's prophecy well. Though it had been some 400 plus years since it was proclaimed that the days are surely coming, here Jesus is proclaiming that the hour has indeed come. And the prophecy is to be fulfilled very shortly. Jesus, in his allusion to the language of Jeremiah, is claiming his place in the establishment of God's long-awaited new covenant. It is no coincidence that the very next chapter in the Gospel of John takes us into the beginnings of the Last Supper. It is in the context of the Last Supper that other Gospels record Jesus using the great language of the New Covenant. This, he says, is the New Covenant sealed in my blood. Yes, the language we hear every time we serve communion to the people of God, we use that language. It is a recognition of the Old Testament prophecy of a New Covenant established in Jesus Christ. It is the recognition that God has sought and is seeking a New Covenant with us and Himself. A new agreement to be our God and we have Him as our God. We see here the real newness of the covenant. In all the previous covenants with God, there was a sacrifice made by humans as a sign of accepting the covenant which God had offered. But now it is God through Jesus who will make the sacrifice. It is a completely different kind of covenant. Indeed, like a seed sown in the ground, Jesus is offering himself to be sown into the ground so that in his sacrifice, others will live. Yet, friends, we must remember a covenant is a promise made between two parties. One is God. And God, through Jesus, has done all of the work to make this new covenant. But we do have a responsibility. Jesus' words are clear. Whoever serves me must follow me. Just as they took Jesus' life, we must be willing to offer ours as well. And just as the death of Christ upon the cross did not truly kill him and allowed him to come back even stronger, so too we must believe that in losing In the losing of the life we have come to know in this world, we will also gain a greater existence in the life to come. The meaning is so simple. All that God asks is that we make a change in our lives and live no longer for ourselves, but for the glory of God in Jesus Christ. That we no longer think about what Jesus has done for us, but what we might do for others in the name of Jesus. That we no longer worry about what we gain from the practice of our faith in Jesus Christ, but rather what the world might gain through our sufficient practice of being like Christ. Serving like Christ. Giving of ourselves like Christ. Willing to die like Christ. It may appear that Jesus is asking for a great deal. To change our lives completely. To think of others before we think of ourselves. To give up who we once were for the sake of serving Jesus. But friends, can we really offer anything less? 
Jesus was quite willing to suffer and die upon the cross for the sins that he never committed. Willing to suffer and die so that we might know who God really is and how much God truly loves us. Willing to suffer and die so that we might not, but rather have eternal life. Jesus died and was laid in the ground, but like a seed he has sprung forth from his tomb and has borne a great deal of fruit to the tune of one-third of the world's population, or at least so we say, so that you might have eternal life. God has made for you this new covenant. In it he has sacrificed not an animal, but he has sacrificed his own son. Jesus was lifted on the cross so that you and I might have eternal life. What are you willing to offer up as your part of this new covenant? Amen.